Welcome back to Black Girl Couch Reviews. I'm your host, Christina. We are back for another recap and review. This one we haven't been to in a little bit. The Haunting of Hill House, Season 1, Episode 5, The Bent Neck Lady. Hands down, best episode. Gave this one a 9.6 out of 10. That ending. I mean, if, if you've watched, you know. Uh, the whole time it took me about three minutes to be like what What? what's happening now uh it definitely kicked up another notch which is exactly where we definitely kind of needed at the midpoint in a season we know what who the characters are now we've got a good grasp of them kicking it off with the mystery of what happened to Nell and getting that full story in this entire episode was really rewarding for those who maybe you know felt it slow around Shirley and around Luke's storylines in particular Steven was okay uh but Theo was definitely probably the best and then the opening episode was also a good setup this one was of course directed by Mike Flanagan and written by Meredith Averill she did some work on Jane the Virgin, which is on CW. I don't watch that show. Actually, I thought that, no, I think it's iZombie that's getting canceled. And then she's actually going to be working on another Netflix show called Lock and Key. And the only reason why that even rang a bell to me is because Connor Jessup is in there and he was in Falling Skies. I thought he was such a little cutie in that show. So I'm interested in seeing what happens in that. I heard it's supposed to be good. And she definitely did a really strong storyline this episode. It felt very cohesive. It didn't feel slow at any moments. You definitely felt pulled in by Nell's struggle, her portrayal. The actress did a phenomenal job with the material that she was given. She definitely felt like the the that child the one that unfortunately no one can help but everyone loves <laughs> and you know just watching her fall apart was very heartbreaking and then seeing the end was just neck bending <laughs> no pun intended but uh no news and gossip before we get in the episode even though i had a funny story just personal i went to this store and this little kid's just and you know when you go in the store parents sometimes need to look behind and see what your children are doing or if they're even close to you this is how kids get snatched up but this father who had four children which is one way too many two per parent at most what am i saying like i don't take four kids every weekend but they asses be up in my house <laughs> occasionally i think once i took them to chuck e cheese by myself and that was a catastrophe <laughs> oh it wasn't so bad but no i didn't love it anyway this kid doesn't even watch where he's going i'm just standing there looking at the chips trying to make my selections and he turns right into the today's i mean his face bounced right into them i felt so embarrassed for him but I was not apologetic. I was like, what? He just looked at me and I'm like, what am I supposed to say? I'm the, I'm the perpetrator. And let me tell you something. I got 42 double D's. These suckers, it's like you get hit by some pillow. So he was lucky I wasn't, you know, flat chested. It would be like hitting a board. But no, nah, he got cushioned well and he learned his lesson. And that was <laughs> my afternoon. That's what I get. Anyhow, getting into this episode, we start off right away the first night at Hill House. It is the scene that we are a little familiar with. And what did this, was this in the first episode? Yes, of Nell, baby Nell, not baby, but you know what I mean. Her scene, the bent neck lady for the first time screaming. She gets in bed with her parents and the... <laughs> this scene cracked me up because it's like they're trying to be i don't know they i felt like i would be a little bit more uh empathetic <laughs> to 
towards my daughter especially the dad you know how i feel about the creepy dad it's just like it was just a dream and now side eye the way she looked at him like her neck snapped so quick and was like bitch i was awake don't sit there and talk to me like i'm dumb and then the mom put she decides oh i'm just gonna blame it on theo <laughs> i'm like what did theo do to become the least favorite child in this bunch because i think there's something else she says to theo later on and i'm like she's not loved <laughs> not by her mother in the way she should be loved you can definitely tell the twins are her favorite but yeah she's like no theo's playing a joke on you she's like it wasn't theo it was a bent neck lady and the dad's like that's a new one I'm like, why are you being sarcastic with your child right now? She is terrified out of her mind. Can you not comfort her, please? And not telling her you're out of your mind. It's just a dream. Go to, go to bed. Like, let her at least sleep in the bed with you. Come on. But mom totally picks her up like, yeah, the next time she comes, you go ahead and uh, call, call me. And then the next night... <laughs> She is sleeping on the days, which we've seen this scene as well. So I'm glad we actually got to see all the characters building up through some of these scenes because it really pays off. And I do love the way the, the symmetry works throughout the telling of this story. And I think it's going to, the next five episodes, it's probably going to be crazy anyways we see mom sleeping on the floor she stays but then she leaves and they did have a nice little conversation right before they fell asleep and they sent dad to get the blanket and she's like i want to see what's in your locket and she's like you know what's in my locket it's a picture of nell and luke and she asked for her locket and she says well i will give you this one day when you are older and just of course as she falls asleep she wakes up paralyzed unable to move as she sees the bent leg lady floating over her and you heard at that moment that the the lady was saying no 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 and i couldn't understand why she was saying that like if that's what she the words that she spoke before she died and so i'm thinking maybe someone killed her maybe her husband but Miss Dudley sheds a little bit more on the story later on in the actual episode. We fast forward to sometime in the present. We didn't know, but this must be, uh, oh, what was the time period? I think she said four years ago that she is talking to who I thought was an intake nurse, but apparently he is a sleep tech. And we meet Arthur Vance, her future husband. And she is talking about being stuck to the bed for hours and that she's frozen. And he calls it sleep paralysis. And he's able to make her not feel like she's crazy because the first time she sought out treatment for this, her doctor basically said, you know, what did she say? <laughs> like, you need to do some exercise or something and i i get that feeling i understand what she meant like one the first time i went to seek my doc ugh, seek my doctor for some uh anxiety for that type of treatment my doctor the first thing he said he's like oh just change your diet and exercise and the second doctor i went to it was so much more of a conversation so much more of a it took into account granted it was a female doctor but took into account what i was going through and what i was actually saying versus this guy who kind of was like oh all you gotta do is exercise and change your diet and everything will just be fine instead of trying to actually solve the issue so i really did connect with her in that moment when she's like well i you know i've never had someone that actually listened to me it's nice and Mr. Arthur Vance is making her feel like nothing's like she's not a freak. Nothing's wrong with you. This is common. People see things when they are, you know, in this type of dream state, they're hallucinations. And Amy, what did I say? Amy, Jesus, I am not watching the passage. Nell, did I say that earlier too? 
Oh my gosh, Nell <laughs> says little spill. He's like, huh? And that's when she says, well, what do I do next, doctor? He's like, well, I'm not a doctor. He's like, I'm a sleep technician. And the next step would be to go ahead and take a sleep test so that we can come up with an escape plan that's basically going to reduce the panic. It's not going to get a away from the paralysis but at least it can treat the symptoms the feeling that she is experiencing when she is completely frozen like that and he asks her you know do you drink coffee and she thinks immediately that he's asking her on a date and he's like no this is a question and she's like oh I'm embarrassed but he does say well I was gonna wait until after you know I was doing my job with you to ask you out but it's cute it's adorable we see them falling in love going on a date having movie night having their first time it's beautiful we go to New Year's Eve and they count down to one they're hosting at his place her place their place whoever and he puts the ring when he proposes in the wine and that is dangerous don't do that ever if she was to drink that she would have choked and then you would have been giving her the heimlich that's not a proper way to do it <laughs> uh but she says yes everyone the family's there for the most part except luke he's never there <laughs> and it's a happy moment sometime i'm guessing that night Nell has a moment where she is in her sleep paralysis. She doesn't see the bent leg lady at this point. She's just in the moment. And I really love how Arthur knows exactly how to handle it. He's like, you haven't had one of these in a while. And he tells her to clench her hands. He helps her breathe. He turns on the light for her. He's easing her out of it. And she's able to finally fall into his arms and I could see why this would be why she breaks down completely after his death because he is the only person in her life that seemed to have cared about her and that's really sad I think that there were maybe her dad had wanted to care about her and I believe her family cares and loves her however sometimes when you're caught up in your own shit it's hard to really uh be that crutch that someone needs and you know that's okay sometimes they need to find that right person that can handle them or get them through this particular hurdle and that was that was him for her and she kind of says as much later on in the episode we get to the wedding she's having her first dance her dad is there but i i see he A did not have any dialogue like usually at a wedding doesn't the father make a huge toast we didn't see that he didn't interact with any of his children they seem to have picked the side of the room that they were staying on and that's where their corners were and then he's looking creepy as always because he is watching Nell like a hawk this entire time Luke would be there but you know Shirley blocked him Nell and my favorite asshole Steve is waiting for the moment Shirley is going to realize that Theo is gay because Shirley is sitting in a chair she's just the way she's staring at her sister like she's trying to figure out a puzzle and it was a really funny scene and they're like she's just like she's so oblivious how why hasn't she figured it out by now Theo's dancing with another woman clearly enjoying herself it's only when Theo starts to whisper sweet nothings into this girl's ear that Shirley's face finally catches on to what's happening I love how she just yanks her husband like what the fuck you know about this <laughs> and she's just she's completely floored but not like disapproving at all and I love that about this family that whatever their problems are it ain't this stupid shit <laughs> about what your sexuality is it's about you know our fucked up childhood and again Shirley's face was still priceless <laughs> she was still flipping out uh, Nell wants Luke to be there 
But Steve's like, don't get your hopes up for Luke, even though she thinks he's going to follow her to L.A., which he does. <laughs> he's like, it must be a twin thing. It's like, yeah, you know, he just follows me wherever I go. And just as they're dancing, Nell sees her mom, who looks to be holding on to her dad. And her dad's still watching her like a damn hawk. <laughs> and she hugs Steve like 20 million times after he says, you know, I'm really proud of you because Steve lives out in LA as well. So they're all going to be closer together. Eight months later, Nell wakes up again. She's having another dream. He says the exact same dialogue, Arthur that is. He says it's been a long time. And just as he goes to turn the light on, he stumbles He's frozen. His neck starts to bend a little bit. It it indicates. And then he falls to the ground. Nell, poor Nell, sees the bent neck lady right in front of the window. And her grief and her pain and how she can't move and how she wants to reach out to him. And she can't. Oh, my heart was really hurting in this moment for her because she could tell she loved that damn man now i'm wondering why the dad was watching her so closely is because he was worried or something else he didn't seem to be like stop the wedding or interfering in her life more you know much but he he did seem to have a protective eye on her uh Nell is in some much needed therapy with Dr. Montague. She's back telling, you know, basically telling him how he died. And he said that it's basically this bent neck lady and the house. And it's all what caused Arthur to die. Even though he says, you know, Arthur's medical report says that he died of an aneurysm. And when is the last time you actually saw this woman? And she points out that basically she hadn't seen her since she met arthur and even then it you know until arthur died it was two years up until that night dr montague is being so nice and trying to really get her to acknowledge her past her trauma but she's like no i know this house killed him (laughs) he finds that very hard to believe and she's like i know i get it we flash back little nelly is playing in the toy room she's looking for a brush to brush her pony and she finds a tea set she runs to mrs dudley and she says look what i found and she goes where and she says in the toy room now did miss dudley say where at that moment because she didn't seem like she knew where she was talking about or maybe that was just me and i missed something there are stars on this cup which is relevant as it plays later on what it signifies i have no idea but uh mrs dudley is able to recognize the t set and that's when we finally get some information on the house and that she used to actually take care of hazel hill which is the mom of a jacqueline hill she shows little nelly their pictures And she tells her that before she died, Hazel, that is, she was talking a whole bunch of nonsense about how Jacqueline needs her cup of stars. She tells her this whole story and Nellie's basically like, so can I keep it? (laughs) I don't give a fuck about all that. Can I keep the set or not? Even though I really shouldn't have fragile things because mommy says I break shit and that's probably true but what is going on with the stars thing i have no clue we finally got some information on the previous owners of the house so much so that they you know miss dudley wasn't was a nurse to one of them she took care of one of them so what is their secret someone look it up uh mommy comes to find miss nelly who's cleaning off her tea set and she is mad as hell she keeps talking like mommy let me see uh that's nice um look at this she said i can keep it Uh uh-huh come on here with me i need to talk to you real quick 
and she brings her to the wall where it says come uh nelly no it just says nelly right mm, yeah just says nelly <laughs> i can't remember actually and the mom's like why did you write this shit and she's like i did not write that and she comes back with well i saw you with chalk and she's like on the patio i wouldn't write on the wall i'm smarter than that <laughs> i love the kid she has so much sass in her she do not suffer fools kindly like don't try to catch me out there just because i had chalk don't mean i did it theo comes in the room like what's going on she always creep in like she about to slap someone who messed with one of her family members and even if that's her mama she's like what you do what you doing she's like well your sister is writing on the damn walls and that's pissing me off <laughs> theo's like well if she says she didn't di do it she didn't do it and the mom starts to have pains in her head it looks like because remember she suffers from migraines and she's like uh, theo's like mom what's wrong well i have a steel plate in my head i told you that bitch crazy and then she tells theo well you can help her clean this shit up since you're defending her ass <laughs> and i'm like dang why did theo do to you she is so not the like child she theo that is fills the wall to confirm that nell was actually telling the truth that she did not write that and that's what it did say she pulled back the wallpaper and i did like theo's point like we're tearing this down anyway i don't know why mom's spazzing and it does say come home now so mom didn't think to keep peeling <laughs> and why does she keep having these migraines and no one seems to take her to the doctor or get her a prescription or something now meets luke in her car on a rainy day he picks her up she picks him up <laughs> this is the most hilarious but saddest scene ever because she's like nuke i'm proud of you because he tells her that he wants to go to rehab and she thinks she's driving him and he asks like she's like well how are you doing and he's like uh, you know whatever how are you doing <laughs> She starts talking about, oh, well, you know, it's 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 going okay. I haven't been able to sleep in the house. Yeah, 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 yeah. Stop over here. To the left, to the right. <laughs> they finally stop in front of the street where a guy in a white hat is. And he goes into this story. This just crackhead. This is a junkie story. So what had happened was, is that... You know in order to get clean i need to first get healthy in order to get healthy i need to get high so you know i need to just get something just to get me in the door when i get in rehab and then i'll be fine but see here's the other thing what had happened was i owe that dude money so i actually cannot go buy my drugs for him so can you just do me this really solid and go buy the drugs for me because that would be really nice <laughs> and Nell's look was like you want me to buy heroin for you like are you serious right now and he's like come on if you loved me he basically put the guilt trip on her he said i believed you when no one else believed your ass he used that against him he's like i know everybody else they mean to me but you come on you know me i believed you i'm like girl first and foremost take your keys and your purse when you leave in the car because she actually fell for this shit i don't know if it was just like she could not deal with I mean because she looked completely flabbergasted like she knows she was played completely and she still does it she gets out of the car she takes twenty dollars goes to get his drugs and that's when he notices that she has prescription meds in her purse and again he, he doesn't even fuck about her what she's going through what she's struggling with her own addictions and this woman is mourning the death of her husband and you have her go buy you heroin and she gets back in the car and she's like 
he just spit it out of his mouth and he says that's what they do that would be my i'm like no that's disgusting people don't do that that's not <laughs> that's what y'all do is is what you know or what we do is what he should have said because that was just uh what if you like crunch like you fell for some reason and you you bit down hard wouldn't all of that heroin you would overdose and die i do like how he is shooting up in the car <laughs> like he gets the needle out he takes the shoe off he is ready he's like oh thank you for this you know this is this is what's gonna get me over and she kind of falls away from herself she she's hit rock bottom she knows she has and i like the the effect of the windshield wiper blades against the window pane and it raining so hard because it just really ratchets up the tension in the moment and she sees the bent neck lady in front of her and immediately goes home and throws out her medication i don't know where these two things maybe she just felt i don't know i think she just gave up at that moment i believe i think even the person that she was most closest to luke failed her in a lot of ways and this is when she completely deteriorates in my opinion she tells dr i forgot his name mangento i'm just gonna call him dr m she tells him that hey remember or that story that just happened with luke she says that happened a month ago and he's like why didn't you bring this up to me before she's like it didn't matter is he all right have you talked to him since then yeah he's good he i was nauseous for about three days but then on the fourth day i was fine and he, you know she's like i know you call bullshit on the shared empathy thing for the twins but i do feel what he is feeling and i'm pretty sure he's getting himself sober so at least shooting up really did help him even though i'm with theo later on and he asked well where is there anything else to the story that you're not telling me and i don't think he she brought up the bent neck lady thing or the fact or maybe she did and she just didn't bring up the fact that she threw out her medication she is then talking to theo who is on her roast train the only person that did not get it from her is shirley but i'd be afraid of that dragon too <laughs> Nell tells Theo that she had helped Luke. Theo's like, well, that was stupid. You should have really called me first. I can't believe you did that. And Nell's like, yeah, that's past. Whatever. Can you help me out with this thing? You know, the thing. And she has Theo touch her pillow. And she feels nothing. And then she wants her to feel the place where Arthur died that's when theo realizes what she's doing and she's like come on for fuck's sake i'm really concerned about you you're sitting here you know clearly at the brink of falling apart you're wanting me to feel where your husband died you need to figure this shit out and does surely know what you did with theo that or not did with theo did with luke that you gave <laughs> because she threw her out of the bus she's like yeah you gave him heroin before he went to rehab like that was real like that doesn't even make sense it shouldn't even be in the same sentence <laughs> and she says well what Shirley doesn't know doesn't know you know and Theo's like well, what does that mean bitch you know what that means she's like uh I know what you did I know you living off that money Stephen may not have told me but I know or maybe Stephen did he petty like that uh <laughs> but she's like you freeloading over at shirley's house you don't got no business lecturing my ass because you're selfish the only person you have ever thought about is yourself and i'm glad you got a nice job and everything but you can't be telling me about adulting from the guest house from your sister's guest house and i'm like damn <laughs> Theo grabbed her stuff and looked back at her like, are we going to make up, are you going to take these words back? 
keep me here because I, I'm not coming back. I'm telling you that right now. And I'm guessing these are the last words they said to each other. So, yeah, they never actually made up. That's terrible. We go to Stephen, who is next on the roast train. <laughs> next to feel Nell's wrath. He is at a question, a Q&A regarding his new book about Alcatraz, I believe. And everyone in the audience wants to ask him questions about his family. It's like, I'm not answering that stuff, guys. Uh, it's been six years, which I didn't realize it was that long since he wrote the book. But he's like, I I'm not answering questions about my family. But hey, just be silent for another 20 seconds. Here's Nell putting all the family business out in the universe like bitch why you write this book why are you writing stuff about stories that you don't even believe you don't believe in ghosts you're telling my stories luke's stories everyone else's and you don't even believe that and you're getting so much freaking money off of it and i just want you to know why and she tells him you say the meanest things to me you're my big brother you're supposed to protect me just tell me why and then he, like two seconds later, he had her on the side, like, come on, why you had to do that? Like the fuck? Like, this is my place of business. This is like my job. You would not come into a factory and start screaming. And he, he kind of had a point there, despite her feelings. And again, it's six years later. He's like, why, why are you complaining now? Why are you filing this complaint now? Uh, it, it don't make no sense. I've watched you go through every type of phase that you go through, the Christian phase, the so she definitely is is one of those. And he's like, this is not the time for you to embarrass me just because you're transitioning yourself right now. And dang, that's the last words. He said to no, because he did call her and tell her that Okay, so that whole scene makes more sense to me. So I thought that rehab that Luke was in was the one that Shirley had paid for, but no, he left that one. And then after he met up with Nell, he went into rehab. Steven didn't know he was in rehab. He called rehab and that's when he realized, oh shit, he's in there. Oh shit, he's got three months sober. That's weird. And then he called Nell from the first episode and let her know, hey, after he got chewed out by Shirley that probably after the last words he said to her weren't very nice and he said you know he's doing fine so that finally makes sense to me ne um, Nell goes back to her doctor and she's like I'm free you know I was out there it felt good to confront my brother and he's like well I didn't necessarily say go confront them I said you needed to deal with your past she thinks she's standing up for herself which she kind of is but at the same time she's not taking her medication <laughs> and the doctor clearly asked that you would think they'd be able to drug test you but if you're going to voluntary counseling probably not but he asked can you be honest with me are you taking your medication she's like yeah i am in a way that says no i'm not he says, this is not about right now. This is not about your family. This is about confronting your past. You need to go back to this house that is haunting you and see that it's just a building. It's a carcass in the woods. It's not threatening. He's trying to help, but he it never works when it's supernatural, bruh. And unfortunately, no one ever believes you when it's supernatural unless they see it themselves. And unfortunately, another thing too and i know it's a trope in movies but it really is dealing with a little bit of my medical background it's some of the signs that present as supernatural that they do have in these shows are symptoms of things like schizophrenia or disassoci disassociative disorder or some type of other trauma so it's not like he's saying you're you know you're delusional or it can't be this it it she presents herself as someone who would be suffering from these types of things coming from her background so I, I i like how they do bring up the trope in a more realistic way with her 
actually seeking out counseling seeking out help and someone trying to get her to confront her demons only to in a sense be pushed into exactly the path that she was going to end up on she the doctor anyway asked what would arthur want she is back in her room she's drinking out of a star cup and she is planning a trip to boston massachusetts and i was like oh no she pulls up in her car to a hotel we don't know what this hotel is at least i don't know she's looking at this bench and she looks at a timepiece and i'm like where'd she get that from and we realize that's her dad's watch and uh, it stops exactly when she hits it twice and we realize this is the same hotel that dad went to on the night shit went down <laughs> all of our, all the kids are in the car like where is mom are we going back for mom shirley's the one who's the mama's girl she clearly really wanted her mother's uh approval and uh, what did luke say he said something like mom she was hurt <laughs> he i don't know how he got them in that hotel room that quick because i know he had to sign some type of paper and get a key but he lets them in and he's like i'm gonna need y'all to chill out right here and i'm gonna go back to the house and get your mother and then i'll be back at some time steve you're in charge <laughs> because everyone wants to know where is mommy what's happening you know everyone doesn't know what they saw but when dad is giving comforting hugs theo and steve don't seem to want that at all as soon as dad's out of the room the family meeting commences and they're all like okay now everyone put their cards on the table steven says he is not sure what he saw so did he take a peek I know he supposedly slept through the whole thing, <laughs> which he did. Theo's looking all types of doom and gloom. She says she does not know what she saw. So she saw something, but she is refusing to fully analyze it. Luke's like, nah, I'm going to spill all the tea. Mom was hurt and she fell on the floor. We was in the red room. Shirley like, what the fuck y'all doing in the red room? We was having a tea party with abigail and mom and that's when nell was like that wasn't mommy and i was like oh who was it i don't know at that time i was like oh that's the bent neck lady <laughs> uh and then i put in my notes did mommy get possessed by the bent neck lady because that's where i was going with nell is doing that thing institution institutionalized people do but she's also doing it the way, was it Luke or Theo that taught her? I think it was Theo. When she was scared that if there's always seven, that, you know, everything's fine. Because she's trying to make herself feel better by counting the packets. As she's sleeping that night, she sees, uh, she has another attack. And instead of the bent neck lady above her, she sees an OD'd out Luke and someone is trying to break in she sees that the door is rattling i didn't really realize my blood pressure had risen until the next scene where it transitioned to dad walking in the hotel room all types of blood soaked even though he said that shit was paint i was like uh-huh but my nerves damn Nell is awake on the bed she's the only one and he's like come on we can talk out here <laughs> she don't seem to be surprised by the blood at all and she's like where's mommy is she you know she she good and he's like she's okay now what does that mean he she looks at at least the red stuff on him and he's like oh that's just paint and he wants to know why she's doing up in the first place she says i was waiting for you i didn't know if you'd come back the shop cops roll up and i'm like oh they they found him that quickly and he's like no i called them myself he tells her that aunt janet is going to be there at 2 p.m to pick her and the other kids up she's like i don't want to go with aunt janet <laughs> she clearly became a kid at that moment she's like i don't want to do that i want to go with you he's like i gotta go with them i gotta straighten some shit out you're gonna be all right so 
she wakes up exactly at 2 p.m. on the day that she dies. She calls all of her siblings because of the nightmare with Luke. So that's where we begin with Nellie in the first episode. Girl cannot go outside and get a drink without shit going crazy because she can't take a couple of sips of some water before the bent neck lady scares the living shit out her and she falls and screams and someone should have called the police if i would have heard that i'm like 911 someone is being murdered <laughs> she hears steve's message and i think at this point she may be thinking am i going it, this is just me am i going crazy no one believes me and now i'm starting not even to believe myself i can't trust what i just saw now i'm wondering does this mean that luke is still in danger of something she goes to the house in the middle of the night she's like oh what could happen at night you know i shouldn't have slept till 2 p.m and i'm like why are you having this conversation by yourself and why don't you have no drugs <laughs> i did like the shot of her staying in a haze all day and not being able to function until it's night and she rolls up on hill house and she says it's just a carcass in the woods and i'm like see bad good people and their their good intentions that turn terrible she calls her daddy and we remember that scene and the lights all come on at this abandoned house that we clearly saw a second ago was abandoned and then the house the porch light blinks twice which is something that her mom would do when she wanted the kids to come in at night she sees the house as it was so she's not seeing it as the you know deteriorated broken down place of the current she's seeing it as it was when she was a child Theo's running in the hallway uh freaking luke is running in the hallway was it steve as well and they're all asking like where you been <laughs> we've been waiting for you and the dad's there the mom they're like come see mom she's like mommy or she goes mama and i'm like when she say mama and that is when the mom is finishing up instead of come home she puts w-e-l so welcome home i don't know i'm like wait huh how does this this lines up somewhere i don't know how because my brain is already just blown by the ending en enough but i know that this ties into something because it, it she saw it as come home when she was a child and it's welcome home now so was it always supposed to be there i don't know is this all a loop that's one of the big questions at the end of this episode they're all you know we always believed you she needs to you know that's when that's what uh all the family members say right and then the mom says that you need to get dressed for bed why aren't, why aren't you dressed she goes upstairs to get the outfit her mom has directed her to get and her mom says you're so beautiful and she goes so are you mama and it seems like she's under some type of it didn't seem like she was herself like she always called her Nell that is her mother mommy she never like mama it felt very like she, I thought she was a different person if that makes any type of sense she goes downstairs because the mom is like oh, we're waiting for your reception you're expected and now the kids are adults and they're all praising her like we're so sorry nelly we should have believed you nelly luke is there and he's sober and she's like thank you for believing in me and now i'm sober and she's in this fantasy world and then arthur is there and i'm like oh no because they put on the song in my feels and they dance around and it's just like their wedding but then wasn't there a dude it was so quick they were doing a turn of the room and i could have sworn i saw like this dude dressed in this gray suit with a top hat and there was a chick next to him with looked kind of like she had one of those 20s get ups on i don't know but that was weird but as she's dancing through the house as we saw before in the first episode uh, the fantasy abruptly ends and she sees her mom again who has a tea set 
and is going up those spiral steps saying we're gonna have a tea party there's you know baby luke abigail is there she's hugging that staircase and she ain't said a damn word like don't do it it's a trap and they all decide but this is what kind of led up to the what happened that night right because it's luke abigail mom and Nell all went upstairs to the red room to get some tea now i thought we were going in the red room we're not going in the red room so whatever happened we still have not gotten that full story she goes up the steps sees some rope there and i was like wait didn't we see something of someone hanging themselves there and she looks down she sees her lovely husband waiting there for her and she had that rope like a noose and i was like oh snap this is how she is totally about to kill uh herself or be killed and she stopped by her mom and i thought for a half a second oh her mom's gonna stop her from doing whatever she's gonna do nope (laughs) she says uh it's time for you to have my locket she gives her the locket and Nell starts to feel some type of way and she starts looking at her mom and holding the locket with this look in her eyes and then the realization hits right like it was at this moment that he knew he fucked up her mom kisses her on the head and is like it's time to wake up sweetheart and the next thing we know poor Nell is falling off of the staircase and her neck breaks and you're like oh damn that's fucked up and then the show does something (laughs) complete she starts to go down and i'm like what what's happening she going to hell (laughs) what is what's going on and she starts to go back through her memories and she is the bent neck lady folks it's her she's been seeing herself why i don't know we go all the way back to her childhood she has been seeing herself since she has been a child she and so when we heard her saying no when we heard the bent neck lady saying no 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 that was poor poor baby freaking adult Nell who is now stuck in the same loop that she began with in her life in her existence as a as a ghost so in a sense she's been seeing her own ghost she I don't know what this all means can she see the future what did why did she come to her in these particular moments Uh, I don't know right when when Arthur died when she was a kid when she was right outside with Luke these were all very pivotal moments that were seemingly pushing her to the edge where she would end up dying the only thing that would have stopped her from becoming this depressed person was Arthur and then he died so and I mean she thought that the house gave him an aneurysm maybe it did maybe it didn't I don't know that I don't even know what this means like I have to watch the next episode because I I need answers and I don't have them (laughs) but very well done the last five minutes that was a 10 even though I gave this one a 9.6 out of 10 I bumped up the score a lot even though I was very invested in nails uh how it was leading up where it left off made everything that came before it that much more relevant and i almost wanted to go back and rewatch the episode to see all the things i may have missed but i ain't got no time for that shit (laughs) so if you want to send feedback on this episode you can send that to blackgirlcouch at gmail.com and you might as well if you want to send feedback for the next episode as well i should be finishing that up tonight You can find my podcast on iTunes, Spotify, and Podbean at Black Girl Couch Reviews. You guys know where my social medias are. Find me there. Till next time, folks. Peace.